Gig Gab, the Working Musicians Podcast, episode 184 for Monday, October 1st, 2018. Greetings, folks, and welcome. To Gig Gab, the podcast by, for, and about working musicians. That means it's by us, for us, but also for you. Here in Durham, New Hampshire, I'm Dave Hamilton. You're in Las Gatas, California. It's Paul Kent. How you doing, Mr. Kent? Doing good, man. I had a really wonderful weekend playing music. A really wonderful weekend. So I'm I'm kind of on a cloud right now. I um I actually had the same thing. I had a rehearsal on Saturday and a gig on Sunday. And um so this rehearsal is for I'll call it a theater show. Uh that's probably the best description I could use for it. It's with my friend Billy Butler. It starts uh in a week where our our tech week starts a week from today. And um and it's an original show. He's written all the music for it. Um, he's the guy who wrote all the music for Bitter Pill that I did two years ago. Right. right, that, right. that was sort of proto Madhouse. And, and I, he'd probably yell at me for saying that, but that's actually how it was. But um, great songwriter, amazing singer, piano player, guitar player, like just one of those people that's just oozes talent and, and creativity, really. And he's a great collaborator when it comes to like, you know, the music side of things. And so we had this rehearsal here Saturday. Wait, wait, what does that mean? He's a great collaborator. So he's a, he's a songwriter, but he, um, he has learned that it's great to have everyone's input on how these songs are arranged and, and formulate. And he's, he's very comfortable most of the time. Uh, you know, there are exceptions where he's like, no, I have this vision. Here's how this song really needs to go and that sort of thing. But for the most part, he's got a structure and he's happy to kind of, you know, assemble musicians that he trusts and throw the song out on the floor and see what happens with us playing these things. And, um, and this show is, it's called the Breck Tones and it's about a, uh, I mean, it is, there is a story to it. It's about a musician playing uh, and Billy's playing the musician, um, a musician playing the last gig of his life in some dive bar. And, uh, and there's poetry readings that are also happening in this dive bar. And it turns out, I think one of the, one of the women that comes up to read a, read a poem is his long lost estranged daughter. And so there's this whole dynamic that sort of happens, but that creates a lot of improvisational elements in the show too, because not only does his daughter, who is a, a character and a cast member come up and read poetry. We have um, local poets and even people from the audience will be coming up and reading poetry and stuff. So the fourth wall is sort of gone and this, the room will be set up more like a club than a, mm. you know, than a, yeah. So it's cool. But, but the, re and the rehearsal on Saturday, I mean, we had some rehearse some of those things so that we have a couple of go to, like if we, if, if inspiration doesn't strike and there's a poet about to do a thing and we need to back him up, go to the Spanish song or go to the <laughs> right. You know, I mean, cause, cause we're pros and we, we want to be ready, but, um, but there's also a bunch of, you know, composed songs that are in this with lyrics that tell part of the story and all that stuff. And, uh, and, but most of them have not been played with a band before they were written for this show. And I think only one of, we played one of them. I didn't realize it at the time. We played one of them in bitter pill years ago. Um, but, uh, it, but you know, otherwise there's songs that were just uh, crafting uh, together or, or at least polishing together. And it, it was so much fun going through this rehearsal and just everybody throwing out ideas. And I mean, there's, there's as many drum parts that I'm playing that I came up with as there are drum parts that say the guitar player or the horn player, like was like, Oh, well, what if you played something like this, you know? And it's like, let me try it. And like, Oh yeah. Well, that works. And you know, and, and so there was this just massively creative collaborative afternoon that I had on, on Saturday That's cool. with great songs. Like the, the outcome, it wasn't just that the process was fun. It was like, we got to the end and it was like, Oh, okay. Actually this show is going to be freaking amazing. This is going to be great. People are going to be. When's it perform? Uh, it is three weekends in a row. It starts not this coming weekend. So uh, this this weekend's like the single digits of October, and so it starts with the double digits of October. Whatever the twelfth, I think, is the first uh, opening night, and then and where Friday, will it Saturday, be? Sunday in Portsmouth, New Hampshire, at the Players Ring. 
Which is a which is a community theater stage. It's a smaller community theater. Yeah, it generally holds about uh, I don't know. It's generally about seventy five people. Um, it's where we did Bitter Pill, and I've done a couple other shows there too. It's a it's a fun little fit little space. Yeah, that's yeah. cool. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So that was it. Was I, I had forgotten? You know, we do we we play a lot of originals and fling, but um, it had been a, because of our keyboard players' sort of work slash life schedule. We haven't been working on new originals in it, or it has been a while since we've worked on new ones. And, um, and so, it, you know, it was just, I, it was a reminder to me on Saturday of like, Oh, right. I like this. Like I, mm. I miss this. This is like, and, and not only do I miss it, I, I'm actually pretty good at it. It's a skill I've developed to, you know, learn how to like craft a drum part that, that fits around the singer and maybe does something creative, but not in the way creative and like the, you know, those sorts of things. It's just fun. So, you know, it's interesting. Whenever you talk about original music like that, you know, I have a great desire to um, record some original music. I have a desire to, to like express that way, but songwriting to me seems like such a personal activity. The concept of collaboration on your thoughts or on your, you know, I'm also stubborn, right? So I kind of want what yeah. I want. So, so I did that. Songwriting seems to be a, 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 a one person thing to me, but I guess for most people, many people, it's a collaborative, you know, especially if you play in a band. But to me, my headspace is that it's a, it's a one person deal. It, it is. I totally get that. I have um, credits on exactly two songs, I think. I don't think any more than that. And they were all with my college band. And, and when one of them was more just a collaboration and really I, it was not my idea. Uh, and then the other one uh, that that made it to, you know, to kind of fruition was completely my idea. And then I sort of fleshed it out with my brother, who was our guitar player. But I remember getting into rehearsals and teaching the band that that tune. And I started playing a, a drum groove behind it. And our guitar player was like, oh, man, like you need to you need to play like like sixteenths on the hi-hat, not eighths. It needs to you know, it needs to be that. And I was like, well, I don't think like, <laughs> yeah, you know, this, this, but this is my song, you know? Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and he, I remember, I, I him, wouldn't be able to get out of my own way on that stuff. I, oh, I would be so defensive about it. I, well, I don't know. he said something to me that changed my mind and it was, well, you know, we are going into the studio to record that album next week. And I think this song should be on it, but I'm going to veto it if it doesn't have, you know, the there you drum go. Groove. a application like, of leverage. <laughs> Aha. Okay. So, and, and, and he wasn't the only one, our singer and the two of them, to be fair, were, were the chief songwriters in this band and, and really good songwriters, Jeff and, and Brian. And uh, Brian was a guitar player and Jeff agreed with him. He's like, yeah, you know, man, I, I really think Brian's right. Like the, the, the groove to this tune, like, you know, trust me on this. I was like, yeah, OK, but that's what it is. It's trust me on this. And yeah. and that doesn't happen. Generally, doesn't happen the first time you meet someone. Right. You know, I mean, we've right. been playing. This was our I think it was our second band together even. Right. You know, so we'd known each other a really long time. Uh, even as kids, we'd known each other. So. But it does. It takes that trust in order for that to happen. Uh, but yeah, I feel you. Uh, <laughs> I know exactly what you're saying. Yeah. 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 But they were right in listening back to to that tune years later. It's like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no. Like, I, I can't imagine it another way. So I don't have any problem being proven wrong or someone having a better idea. It's just right. it's been a long time to get to the place where I'm open to it. Right. Yeah, unless there's a shortcut of a deadline, in which yes, case. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> hey, so I wanted to talk about. Um, after you posted last week's show, yeah, because at the end of last week's show, I made a comment about the various projects that I'm in. And I, I think the comment was really circled with that yeah. you and I. Do you want me to read? Do you want me to read Patrick's comment? I have it up yeah. in front of me. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So uh, Patrick on, on Facebook in our, our group at giggabpodcast.com slash Facebook said, uh, just finished your most recent podcast and I have to say, great job, guys. I love the bit where Paul had his guitar out. We got more comments about the fact that yeah. we, we dug in. That was so good. Yeah. Uh, he says, I love that bit uh, and was playing along to drive my car. That was something I never heard you do before and it was pretty cool. I was struck when I heard the last bit previewing next week's conversation about how 
far Paul's outlook has evolved since the very first episode of your podcast. I heard where Dave and Paul had their first disagreement over whether one should play in multiple bands or focus on just one. I don't know if now is the time to revisit that old conversation, but it just struck me when Paul was listing all the projects he is currently involved with. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I read that and um it's like looking in the mirror and not liking what you see sometimes, right? Yeah. So it, it was it was like I'm been very vocal that I don't like subs in my band. I you know, I want the commitment. And I heard that comment. I don't think this is necessarily what he meant, but that's certainly the the light that came on for me is like, am I a hypocrite? Am I am I, you know, not walking my own walk, you know, and I thought about it a lot. So I, I wanted to talk a little bit about how I got to where I am. So we'll do a little bit of Dave therapy here. So, okay. you know, I start, I remember when I started the house rockers, I had just picked up my guitar again after putting it down after raising a family and I wanted to be in a band. And I, I started looking around and a few connections and put out some ads and, and, um, uh, I couldn't find, um, a singer that would lead a band that I would be excited about. And so that's why I started to sing, never having sung before. Got it. And um, uh, it, it served me okay in that I think I do a good job of that. But certainly I wasn't a trained singer and I certainly wasn't a professional singer. And, you know, I have a curve, have had a curve to get over with regards to, you know, proficiency with vocals. I could emote fairly well, but you know, how to control my instrument and you know, how to, how to improve range and how to breathe and all this stuff was totally foreign to me. So that was, that was a process. But anyway, um, I started the house rockers and put it together. I knew I wanted a horn band. It just struck me that it would be a nice different sound. And actually when I started the house rockers, um, I wanted to living out here in California. I wanted to play the music that I loved growing up with on the East coast. So a lot of Bruce, a lot of Southside Johnny, that was the stuff I still listened to still got me so excited. And I was like, Oh, it would be different for people here. Um, they would hear something they haven't heard before. Wouldn't that be great? Right. Uh, thinking different was good. And, you know, we've had a lot of conversations about different can be good, but a path to cover band success is often through familiar. Right. Right. And I, it took me a while to learn that lesson. Anyway, the band goes and the band goes on, the band goes on. Um, I've had my, uh, uh, struggles getting a culture in my band that everybody bought into. And that was the same commitment for everybody. Right. Yep. Um, everybody rehearsed the same, everybody showed up at the same time, you know, no subbing yourself out. Um, the horns in the early days, you know, how to manage a horn section horns are a lot more used to being sidemen. They're used to reading charts. They're used to, since they read charts, thinking that someone else can come in and read their chart. And it took me quite a while in working with my horns. And actually, you know, we crossed the level where the amount of work that the house rockers offered was enough to secure that commitment. Right. So the house rockers go on, we've built this brand, we've built this following, we've, you know, built a, you know, a pretty good thing. And a couple guys in my band go off to play some original music. Now they all might've had some level of other things going on over the time, sure. but this was a watershed moment for me. So this was probably about seven years ago. So if we're about to go into the house rockers, 20th year. So this is after the house records are 12 or 13 years down the road. The, the lineup has been set for maybe five or six years. And one guy wants to go off and play some original music. And he asked a couple other guys in the house rockers, unbeknownst to me, oh. you know, do you want to do so this? Not, not just one guy leaving, but one guy taking people with him. That's interesting. Right. Yeah. And okay. so, and so we had never really had much of a problem He'd had some other types of projects, but it was so sparse. And when the, I had the conversation, you know, like, what does this mean? He goes, this is a band to do original music. It may play six times a year if that. And then it turned out to be started to grow into a few more things. And then, you know, the conversation was like, listen, you three guys are making a choice now that if you take a gig with this other group, that's seven guys in our group that can't, there are only so many weekends in a year. That's seven guys in our group who can't work. Yep. It was totally foreign to me to have anything else going on, but they insisted. They're like, you know, listen, I play in the house rockers and you know, I love playing in the house rockers, but um, you know, there's other th musical expressions in my life that I need to, that I need to have. Yeah. 
I, I, so I, it, I, I will interrupt there, but only briefly. I, I, I get that. Like when I was um, starting out and playing in bands, like once I joined a band, it was like that. That's what I did, you know. And I remember, and I've even said on the show that I had this drum teacher that sort of coached me and said, uh, you know, man, it's not your girlfriend. Like you, you can and should play other styles. He's like, you know, that's the only way you're going to develop as a player and really expand and be able to do lots of different things later in life is to just do lots of different things. It doesn't happen magically. And I was like, yeah, man, that's cool, John. But you know, I, uh, like I'm in this band and then I got, uh, I think I was like 20, maybe, I don't even think I was old enough to drink, but maybe I was, I don't know. It could have been you know, somewhere in my early twenties, I got a call last minute from a drummer that I knew that said, look, there's this big festival happening downtown. Uh, there's a band coming in. It's this prodigy, like uh, piccolo bass player. And it's a piccolo bass, a real bass. There's no guitar. So he's like the guitar player and then a keyboard player. And, uh, and they don't have their drummer and they need a drummer for this gig. And he's like, and I certainly can't do it. He's like, that's not my deal at all. He's like, but you can play. He's like, you got to do this gig for me. Cause I guess he was organizing the festival in addition to being a you know drummer or whatever. I was like, okay, cool. Like, can't say no to that. You just, you know, you just propped up my ego. Like, sure. <laughs> right. So I showed up, we literally rehearsed the tunes in the bathroom uh, about 10 minutes before we went on. We played like all blues by Miles Davis and we played some funk things and, and it was, and it was basically, we just lay down a groove so that this piccolo bass player could, could shred. Right. And everybody was cool. And so it was like, okay, we went through the tunes. Like you got this groove, you got this groove. The bass player's like, I got you. I'll walk you through this. We're good. You know, like, okay, cool. So we went on stage and it was freaking amazing. Cause you know, here was this completely different experience, different caliber of musicians. And I'd played with in, you know, in, in my band, uh, like the way this gig happened, it was so foreign to me that, you know, a band could communicate this way on stage. Not that we had bad communication in our, in the band I was in, but it was just this radically different experience. And it was like, okay, now I get it. That's, this is what John was talking about. My teacher, John, uh, you know, I got a like, I, I, and it, but it took me a couple of days to think like, well, okay, like, do I go back to my band and like yell at them and say, we got to do things differently. It's like, well, no, like that's not probably not going to play well. It's not going to get me what I want. What I want is to also do some other things so that I can sort of have all of these experience. I want my cake and eat it too. Yeah. So, so I get that, but it also, well, I also get that it causes problems. <laughs> and so I, let me go back to my headspace yeah, at the time. Okay. Right? So my headspace was, a band is a cause, right? It's, it's a, it's a team working together to accomplish success. That was my, yep. if I could as succinctly say it as possible, that's what a band is. It's supposed to mean something to its community. It's supposed to mean something to its audience, its fan base. And we need to all be on the same. And, and the net result of that, of us all being on the same page should make the band more successful. Yes. Right. So if the only place you can come see me sing is here you know, then that makes it a more special thing. Yes. If I, you know, like my friends who are out playing all over the place, what makes it unique? So, you know, how do we make a house rocker show a special thing all the time? And that, that was kind of my, my guiding principle. Aren't we all in this? And so I was really hurt. I was really taken aback that, you know, that someone wanted to diffuse the musical energy, you know, diffuse the brotherhood, diffuse the mission. You know, yeah. I was really, really hurt. And, and, and like I said, why, why should we create the situation? And if all 10 guys in my band had that same perspective, we would never be able to put a band on stage. Right. If all 10 of them, right? So once one guy went down that path, it really was concerning for me. Cause like a, the most obvious, literally if 10 guys had other projects and, you know, even if they gave me notice, if I had to manage 10 guys schedules, we would rarely be able to, to get on. So, right. so, so. So I think the, the, the like, because now we have these two things, right? The band is a cause and I buy into that. Like I, I, I don't disagree with that, but then there's also this, but I have other things than music is my passion and I need to feed that passion. And any one project is not going to, to do that. Right. I yeah. mean, it, it, like maybe for some people I have yet to find that project. Uh, so you know, how do you reconcile these two things when they are, you know, two simultaneous beliefs? 
And it's the concept of opportunity cost, right? Um, you know, you playing in the house rockers to, to kind of put it on in your scenario, playing in the house rockers requires that you're available, uh, you know, X number of weekends per year or, or, you know, only, only not available much less than X number of weekends per year. Right. And, and so can you, it is, is the house rockers gig important enough that you want to keep it or, is that not important enough when you compare that opportunity cost, right? Because you can't do two things on the same night, right? So you got to pick one and then yep. you got to be fair to the scenarios that you're talking about. And, uh, you know, I say this uh, sounding like I, I have it all figured out. I don't. I still. Well, you're identifying up. the problem, right? It, right I'll give you a good example. Yeah. There is one horn player that I've had over the years who was the most. Um. I guess I'll say cagey about, uh, you know, wanting to do other things. Yeah. Right. And it finally crossed my line. And I said, listen, let's make you a second call. Let's make you a sub. Mm. And let me get someone who's going to be here every time. You know, you know, I get that you want to do some other stuff. Yeah, or let's the remove the, the shared commitment yep. here. Yep. The light bulb immediately went on and. And uh, he was like, nope, <laughs> you know, I don't want to lose all these gigs. Right. Opportunity so, cost. Yes, <laughs> exactly. So, you know, confronted with it in the right way. Again, if you're going to be threatening with someone, you're going to create a different dynamic in the in the conversation. You've got yes. people acting out of out of fear, or out of emotion or out of you yep. know anger. Or whatever. So that and then you may someone may say something that they don't mean to say. So, again, this is all part of the psychology of being a leader. And I actually think that's one thing here. You know, I'm, I'm approaching this from my perspective as a, as a band leader. If four guys get together and say, hey, let's form a band and let's make all decisions together, there's a different dynamic to the way that those conversations go. But pretty much, you know, what you said is what I did. I said, here's the expectations. You need to leave your weekends open until 30 days within. Mm -hmm. If I don't have you booked, you know, on the first of a month, you can take anything, you know, during that month. But, you know, the only way that we're going to be able to play and I don't have to manage 10 people's schedules is, you know, this. And, you know, I also want to put a, a, a quality show on stage every night. So if I have subs reading stuff down, it's never as good as the band that knows the material. So I just this is my mantra. I say it over and over again now. So now I got these guys who go out and do something and I'm struck with the injustice of it that seven guys are going to have to stay home while these three guys are out having a gig. And um, at the same time, an opportunity to sing at a fundraiser with uh, two friends of mine that became Acoustic Madness comes up. That happens. It's fun. Hey, we should do this again. And in the back of my mind, I'm like, well, those guys are, you know, taking some gigs. I guess that's the way it goes. <laughs> you can't beat them, join them. Well, well, that's it. And then all of a sudden I'm down, I'm down the rabbit hole. Right. And so yeah. that leads to someone asking me to do a solo gig that, you know, we're going to skip through time rather rapidly here. One of my solo gigs um, uh, says, Hey, you know, we love it, but we're only going to book duos now. Hey, Simon, want to do a duo, <laughs> you know, uh -huh. and you know, various in, Cantations of this happen. Um, I had one gig that's a good gig that is like, you know, I've been doing solo acoustic. He goes, Hey, we're not going to do that format anymore, but we want you to stay. Can you put together, you know, a small combo to play? You know, it's a, it's a winery gig. And so, yeah, I, I know some guys. And all of a sudden, I know I, and then this, so it's interesting what, when this, this note comes in on Facebook, right? And so I'm kind of looking in the mirror and I'm like, Well, what's going on? Where is my head on this? Because, you know, a lot of stuff is, is really rewarding. How do I feel about that <laughs> that place I was at once upon a time, where yeah. like a band is a cause? But it, but see, and, I don't. I, if I if I may, I don't think that changed in your head. I still think the House Rockers is a cause for you. It, it just, absolutely is, and I prioritize the House Rockers. Right. And that, that's kind of my point: is I will uh, sub myself uh, on, on gigs of a better house. Rock. The house rockers are my priority. That okay. is, that, so that is was my, what, that was my question. Cause you're, because you are in the unique position of being the only person in the band who books the band. Well, with there the you house go. Rockers. So here's the deal. So that lets um, you, I mean, you could stand and appear or at least argue that you are righteous because you've never taken a gig on a night that the house rockers play, but to be fair, <laughs> you well, control yeah, the schedule. Right. Well, no, here's I know. I'm so, not saying you are. I'm just I'm just painting like there's a picture here that we should shine a light on if we're going to shine a light. Yeah. So when Russ joined the band a year ago, he had a couple other things that, that he does. Yep. 
Um, and the last band that he played with played a little less than the House Rockers. And so he had more time to get involved with these other things. But when he joined the House Rockers, I said to him, you know, this has to be your first call and this has to be this has to be the way it works. Because anyway, he goes, OK, well, you know, under what scenarios can I take gigs with these other people that I play with? And I said, if the House Rockers aren't playing and I typically book most things three to six months out and, you know, pretty much it's that 30 day thing. And he goes, well, how do I know, you know, what you've booked for your other things? Ah, oh, that's fair. And then, well, that is fair, absolutely, and smart. And so, I I shared my music calendar with him yeah. that I keep personally, yeah. so he can do that. Yep. And he says, "Well, you know, you're not booking for yourself within 30 days. I mean, you're booking whatever you want to do." And that I was really floored. I had to pause for a moment. I'm absolutely right. Nobody's asked me this question before. Right. And I I said, "I'm going to have to claim this as executive privilege since I'm the one booking the house rockers." Huh. You know, and the the barn door was open and, you know, that we've gone down this path of other people do do some other things. And I reiterated my commitment is to the House Rockers. We will play. And especially in the summertime when the House Rockers, you know, play quite a bit. My priority is there, but I'm happy to share my music calendar with. But I think it's reasonable of me as the band leader, the band founder, that I will make the decisions. You know, I, I've either created something that's worth your commitment and time or not worth your commitment and time. And he seemed to be. He's listening to this probably. He seemed <laughs> he seemed to be that seemed to be an acceptable answer. I shared my calendar with him. If there were dates out in the future that I was booked for other things, um, he can take them, you know, with this other group yeah. that he plays with. I did let him know, you know, but I will if a really good paying thing, you know, because one of the ways I keep the house rockers, you know, moving is I get him paid, right? right. So if right. if good gig comes in, I will and have substituted, you know, changed a solo date or a, or a do or any other kind of acoustic date um, to take advantage of this for the house rockers. It it doesn't come up that much, and you know, to some degree, if something comes in, you know, a, a, an offer for the house rockers, and I am booked on something, depending upon what it is, I might ask and say, "Are there any other dates that this can happen?" Right. To see if I can avoid the the double booking. Yeah, of course. But, um, but uh, I have, you know, I'm, I don't, I don't wave the flag on it in my band and let them know. But, but you know, I do move other things. The house rockers are my priority. Sure. I love the band. I love that in many ways it has achieved a vision that I had when I started out. Um, it is, it is when it's when it's going great. That sense of teamwork with ten guys and the sound the band puts out—it still thrills me like it did when we first started. That's and right. it is it is something that it still has my heart. It is fun to express other ways. There's always time to do that. So I can take Wednesday night gigs, not, you know, house rockers don't play too many Wednesday night sure. and still get, get my yayas out. I have one standing solo acoustic gig that is valuable to me. But, you know, again, if something came up, I would, I would sub it. And then I have my trio and again, I love those guys. Um, but it is something I did after the house rockers, but I actually, that post, you know, that was shared, it, it really had me reflect on this whole thing again, because, net net of all this stuff as the guy who founded this band that's kind of grown in in success and fronts it and then now has gone out and done some other things and originally when i went out to do those other things you know it it has some value paul from the house rockers is doing a show here sure that gets people out and so i am able to leverage that and a little bit different than the scenario that you're sharing i get to enjoy some leverage and some, some value in um, that now I've kind of built a career that's around my name. You well, know, but, but that's equally, it's not different, right? Because, uh, you know, I, I mean, using me, I've built a career that's around my name and I get phone calls to play gigs and, fair uh, enough. It, right? I mean, it's the same thing. It's just, you, you know, it, it, it's slightly different implementation, but, it, but, it, but it's also the same on the flip side. Like if, I'm not available often for someone like, you know, like has happened with Amanda, you know, she winds up getting a lot of last minute bookings and stuff and she'll text me and be like, can you play tomorrow night or tonight? And uh, usually my schedule's locked, you know, 48 hours out. You know, if, if I don't have a gig, I've already planned something like with my family or whatever. Some of those things I can move. Some of those things I can't, some of those things I can, but I don't want to, you know, like it's just how things go. So I wind up playing with her a lot less because I've got other things going on. And and that's mm -hmm. that's true with lots of things. Right. You know, it's back to that opportunity cost. You know, you can't be available for everything every night. 
Um, but the, and so the flip side is true for you. If you, I don't want to even use the word abuse. If you uh, don't book the house rockers enough because you're booking other things or simply because you're not booking the house rockers. I mean, it, you might have nothing to do on a night. If you're not doing your work to book the house rockers, regardless of the reason, well, then you're probably going to start losing band members because right. you're because the, you don't have gigs for them. Right. So it like that cuts both ways. You are putting in the work to book the house rockers, whether you put in that work 20 years ago or not. I would say is almost irrelevant now. I mean, it's cool that you've built a thing, but in terms of retaining band members, it's probably about what's next, not what came before. Right. I mean, just to be realistic about it. I'd say 80, 20, I say, you know, the history and someone being able to say they've been in a band for this long, there is some, there is some value that people for their own brand, you know, they like identifying as being a house rocker, I believe. And, um, no, that's fair. I I think your 80, 20 number is probably right. Yeah. If the work dried up and, you know, for some guys, it's a financial equation and for some guys, it's a it's a prestige equation. Right. Yeah. So, um, uh, yeah, if the work dried up, you know, that goodwill of the past 20 years has a, a shelf life. Right. It's got a shelf. Yes, exactly. It's well, the goodwill over the past 20 years exists because in part you're still doing it. Right. It Otherwise, it's just it's nostalgia. Right. But it's not nostalgia. Yeah. It's a new thing. I mean, you're playing older songs, so maybe there's some nostalgia, but you're, that's what you that's your product. So that's a good yep. thing. Yeah. Yeah. But to kind of sum that whole concept up is um, I still. I hope it's not a rationalization, but I still look in the mirror and say, what do I stand for? And what I stand for is to be the leader of a band. That's that's mm-hmm. who I am. I'm, I see myself as a band guy more than a solo guy or, or, a, you know, sure. other things. And, um, that to me is a meaningful musical life, you know, is, is getting your team together, getting your team psyched, getting, you know, great gigs. I enjoy, I enjoy getting gigs. I really enjoy paying the guys. Yeah. There's, you know, they, I just, you know, it feels like, Yes. You know, this is my role in this. This is what I asked you to sign up for. And, you know, I'm going to deliver on my part of all this and and you're going to deliver on your part and then we're going to go merrily on. And that, you know, is probably the essence of why it's 20 years. And, you know, I have so many guys, most guys in my band, this is the longest single gig that they've ever yeah. had. Right. You know, yep. playing something 15, 18 years. That's a that's a long time. Yeah. I, I, I want to I don't want to skip this. That that concept of I enjoy paying my band That needs to be a thing that matters to you if you are going to run a band like the one you run, because it will not last. If you're just doing it to get your own personal yayas out on stage or whatever, that will fall very thin soon for everyone around you. Right. What do you mean by that? Well, I mean, if if it's all about, well, I formed this band because there's songs I want to play and I want to do this thing and I want to do that. If you don't. If you aren't paying your guys or you're not prioritizing that this is a part of it and I'm, you know, I enjoy paying them and now you're going to work to get them paid a little more. Like, you know, it's it's that concept of that which is is monitored is managed. Right. So if it's something you think about, then it will most likely be a thing that that works well. And but if your whole reason, i.e. the thing you think about is furthering, you know, your own ego and all of that stuff. If that's the only thing people around, like you're not going to retain musicians. And obviously you've retained musicians and it's in, in, at least in part because you prioritize caring for them. And and, I'm a good boss. You're a good boss. Yeah, exactly. Right. (laughs) Yes. And I I actually, I desire to be a good boss. Like that's part of who, that's that's my my approach to everything in life. Right. I know a guy in this area who, um, he has a band and the band is his name. Mm -hmm. Uh, wait, wait, let me just start this again. He has a band that's his name. Um, the moving parts as to who is behind him on any night change. Yep. It is, it is an exercise in him and that, and the tacit relationship between those con- con- constantly moving parts is, you know, I'm a semi pro to pro. I will show up. I will give a good show. I will, you know, they don't, you know, he doesn't ever know who's going to be on a show. So I, I don't, I don't think that it's a very rehearsed thing. Right. But right. it's, it's a, it's, it's a financial transaction. Well, it, it's a 90, 10, 90 percent financial. And then in any of this, you know, music, it's not enough mu- it's never pay, enough. Usually. Right. It's right. always 10%. I love to gig and, you know, if, if not more. Yeah. And, um, 
<laughs> but that's uh I was doing that uh, math earlier today. I think I think for one gig I'm I'm doing it's zero one hundred, but that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> Every, well, everybody has their number, right? Yeah, yeah. Everybody yeah. has their number, yeah, but that's you know, not I, a good think, number, though. Like it, that's that's not sustainable. But it's well, it's that's fine. the deal. Is like yeah, that business deal. model right. is going to continue. That there will constantly be a revolving a revolving door of musicians behind this guy if he doesn't become a better boss. Yes, right. Yes, or or, or He's he's chosen this business model like I don't want to have to manage people and I don't want to have to do this. So I'll get the gig. I have a fake book. You come back me up and uh, and, yep. you know, we'll we'll play Johnny but Be Good all he's night. He's not going to you know? retain the same band doing that. And, and, and that it doesn't to me, seem goes like back to a, right. a band is a cause, right? Yep. Yep. A band is a cause. It is a, it is an expression of family. It is an expression of community. It is an expression of brotherhood. Well, I mean, your, brother and sisterhood. Your band is, but that's what I'm saying. But not, that's my but not that guy's band, right? That's right. And and that's okay. I mean, it, but it it is helpful. And I, again, you know, we've got people that listen to this that want to create their own bands or working to, to do that, or perhaps have their own bands. And I, and I, that's why I wanted to kind of revisit that, you know, that concept of, of, well, really you, you summed it up as being a good boss, wanting to get your people paid, showing them you care about them, showing them that you're doing the things that you need to do so that they have the opportunity to do the things they can do. Right. This is, this is not stuff that comes automatically, frankly, to most people, even right. people that are very good at it, usually have to learn it somewhere. And often the way you learn is by falling flat on your face a couple of times yep. and then, Oh, ah, right. I need to, I ah, got it. You know, it's like, okay, cool. Now, you know, I'll, I'll be better. Sorry. But, um, but so th that that's, it's a really important thing. If there's one lesson to take away from this, I think it's that is if you're not, if you don't care to prioritize being a good boss, then you should not be the leader of a band that is a band leader band. It might be better to be in a band that's, you know, a democracy of sorts. And we've talked about how those can work and can't work. Um, but, you know, it's like, think about that before you do it. You have to, you know, you have to want that. Yeah. Yeah. I had a, uh, I had a gig yesterday outside, Paul, and there's one lesson that I would like to share. It was a, it was actually a great thing. The town of Rochester, New Hampshire here did this thing they called Porch Fest, where in and around the downtown, they found as many spots, some of them stages, some of them porches, some of them rooftops of buildings where they could put a musical act, mm. uh, all sort of within walking distance. And then there were you know, there's shops and restaurants that are just there because that's where they are. And then they had like food trucks and other little craft vendors. And, and it was a great thing on a beautiful fall Sunday afternoon. And so we were one of the bands that played, uh, and there was a band playing, uh, on the stage before us. Actually, they, they were really smart. They put two stages in this one. We had one of the bigger spots and they put two stages in this parking lot and they had one band setting up while the other one played. And then when that band stopped, you know, with maybe a five minute break, maybe not the next band would play for an hour and a half. And then it was, and then you had an hour and a half to get set up. So we get there right as this band before us is, is, uh, I, I actually, some of the guys got there early. I had a podcast to do yesterday morning, so I, I couldn't be there to see them, but, uh, but you know, I got there when it was time to set up and I start taking my drums out of the car and these guys took a long time getting their stuff off the stage. And, and I, and they're nice guys. Like I know them and I know it wasn't, I know they just did, simply didn't think about it. They had long treks back and forth to their cars. So instead of, instead of staging things and getting everything off the stage and then, you know, shuttling it to their cars at their leisure, they simply shuttled it to their cars at their leisure. And, um, you know, we were patient with them and it was fine. It worked out. We knew how much time we really needed to get set up and stuff. But when you're doing those multi-band gigs, Bear in mind, and I and I know to some of you, this is a super obvious thing that I'm saying, but trust me when I say that it's just not obvious to everybody. Think about who needs the stage next and how quickly you can get your stuff off. Conversely, as the band that's going to be coming up on stage, think about what you can do to limit the amount of time you need. Like for me, when I realized that this thing was going to take longer, I thought, well, I could be really pushy on these guys or, you know, I could set up all my drum stands here. 
and then just move them on stage when it's done. And the reality is doesn't really change anything for me. So why don't I do that? And then if they're still not off stage, maybe at that point I can help with the last couple of pieces and, you know, accelerate this process and sort of teach by example, you know, but, um, and, and so that's what I did. And, and then that's basically what happened. But, um, but yeah, thinking about, you know, how you can stage yourself and, and thankfully it was an outdoor gig. So sound is actually pretty easy outside. You don't have yeah. reflections to deal with for feedback. You pretty much run everything flat, crank it up till it feeds back, turn it down and you're good to go. So I honestly don't know if we can do, um, festival gigs anymore. I mean, we've kind of, you know, 20 minutes to get a 10 piece band, just get a band yeah, off see, and had- us on and mic'd and sound checked, line checked. Yeah. You know, it, it's always late. It's always stressful. It's never right. And it's, uh, I just don't know. I mean, I would consider ourselves fortunate that we might be able to be in that position where we can pick but, and choose. Well, that's with the house rockers, but you could do it with acoustic madness. Absolutely. Right. Yeah, I mean, that, and, you know, it's with a, with a different outfit. Yeah. And, and also we had a full hour and a half because of the way they had organized these logistics. The only part that was a little weird was we got ourselves, you know, we're on stage, we're set up and we still had like a good, you know, almost 30 minutes before this other band was going to finish. And, uh, and I was like, okay, cool. Well, let's, let's do, I mean, we'll mute the mains, but let's do line checks on the, on like vocal mics and stuff and just make sure that everything's where it needs to be. And, uh, like, right. We don't have power until that band's finished over there. And I was like, what? Like, yeah, they only ran one extension cord to the parking lot. So we, they've just been swapping it back and forth between stages all Mm -hmm. day long. It was like, Right. But we run a digital board, so it's really <laughs> difficult to do anything without power. So uh, so we went to one of the shops that was right there and we were like, hey, can we plug in an extension cord here? And they're like, yeah, no problem. So I was like, OK, cool. And then, it, then we got it up and running and it was all fine. But yeah, it was like, oh, huh. Right. I, I can see where that would have been the thought. Like this band's not going to be making noise while that one right there is, you know. <laughs> I saw some of the videos your wife posted. You sounded great. I mean, Thanks, the man. secret. I just love how you play that. I mean, you have enough Keith and enough and enough uh, enough not Keith. I don't know if you know what I'm, what I'm trying totally to say. Know you what have enough. Mean. You're yes. free and you play it like Keith and you get the feel of Keith. But but we can always find the groove in it, right? Which is a hard thing when people try to imitate Keith, right? Yes. No, I don't it's try to imitate little... Keith. I simply play that song. Is what I do. Um, And, and so, so I'm glad to hear exactly that. Like that there's a, I play that song with, with the idea that I can be pretty bombastic with the drum fills. Like I can sort of go overboard that I might not do in, you you know, like a tune like tempted or, you know, something like that, where it's like, no, this is a well-crafted song. The seeker is a well-crafted song too, but it's bombastic as hell. Right. So, um, yeah, 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 yeah. It was a fun. Good thank job. you for saying that, man. Yeah, it's a. It, it was a fun gig. So, yes. Oh, looks like I did not mute my phone before the podcast, my friend. Sorry about that. <laughs> oh, you know these things happen. It's been a day. Ah, uh, anyway. So yeah, yeah. It, uh, but it worked out. It was a really nice thing, and a, you know, fun to play an outdoor gig. Um, just prior to October. That's probably the last one for us, for me, for the for the year before. Oh uh, wow. Well, I mean, it's, you know, now it's October 1st. People yep. don't generally book outdoor musical performances now because it, it could be 40, you know? Yeah. yeah and we have our last outdoor one. Well, no. So we have, we have an outdoor one. A church carnival is uh, coming up and we're doing it without Nick. So the first gig ever. So Nick had to go to a family wedding. He just couldn't get out of it. Sure. I missed this gig last year because I was out of town on business and I think it's the only time ever that I have, except for my daughter's wedding, that we subbed me. Um, but uh, Nick's gone. So we're going to play all of our rock stuff. It's just going to be two guitars, bass, drums, and the horns. And, you know, we, you know we're not going to play this stuff. You know, nobody's going to pick up singing what Nick pick, what Nick sings. Right. So we're going to do it. And, you know, just, just our rock stuff. Some stuff will sound a little thinner, I'm sure. Some stuff we probably will skate by. But it was, it's going to be a, a trip, you know, doing it without one of my key guys. Yeah, subs happen, man. Wow, that's really interesting. I I wasn't sure that that was something you would ever do. I thought about that. Like, would, would the only you reason I'm going to do it is because I missed the gig last year and I didn't want to bail. This is someone we've been playing for for years, mm. and I didn't want to bail two years in a row on this guy, and um, so I kind of felt an obligation to do it. So, so he knows. So- 
Yeah. Does he know that Nick's not yeah. there? Because I like if it, it and, and hopefully one of your horn players doesn't take this the wrong way. But, you know, n- n- subbing out one of your horn players versus subbing out one of your lead singers and, no. and lead front men yeah. is a radically different thing. Right. Radically. And and uh, so that, that that is something where it's like, oh, you know, do you need to. Do you need to divulge this, especially if it's somebody that's booked you in the past. And now yep. it's like, oh, wait a minute. What do you mean? He's not here. Like, that's yep. what I thought I bought. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. You got to be upfront about that. Stuff. Yeah, I, I agree. Well, I mean, it to a degree. Right. You know, if you subbed out, uh, you know, your drummer, like, uh, you know, and in most bands, I mean, Fling, it'd be they'd probably want to tell people because I sing half the songs, but you know, otherwise just about the drummer. It's fine. Like as long as the groove's there, you're good. Right. Most yep. people don't notice the drummer. So, yep. Yeah. I notice you, Dave. I know. I notice me. And, uh, <laughs> That's good. you know, I, it's funny. I have actually been having this conversation in different ways, but, um, especially as I'm deciding which theater gigs to take as they come to me. And I don't know, like I've learned, I don't really care if the crowd sees even sees me, let alone notices me. But I really care if the rest of the band and the and the, and I when I say the band, I mean everybody, the cast, the music, you know, the actors, the singers, the musicians, all of that. I like that interaction is what matters to me, right? And mm-hmm. so so as long as the people on stage notice me and and we get to like create a thing together, then I'm good. That's that's the payoff for me. That's that's what I'm you in know. it for. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, we have we we did not get to our topic of iterating uh, and innovating the cover band process. So I think we're going to take that uh, and push it to next week's show again, unless one of you comes up with a topic that's even more timely and better. So that's what I think. What do you think? I'm up for it. All right, cool. You got anything else for today, my friend, or are we? Uh, we send no, I'm out. good. I'm okay. glad I had a chance to emote that all out and just kind of think of it. So thanks for listening. It's good to be self-reflective. It's good to be self-aware. I, like this, these are good things. Sometimes, like you said, they're, they're not easy, especially at first when you look in the mirror and you're like, oh, right. Okay. You know, and then you process and that's a good thing. It makes us better artists. I think, you know, we're not lying to ourselves. Yeah, it's good. Yeah, it's cool. Anyway, all right, folks, thanks for hanging out with us. Thanks for Patrick, thanks for your question. Uh, hopefully, everybody says thanks to Patrick for their question, for his question. Uh, you can visit us at slash Facebook. And also, you can email us feedback at giggabpodcast.com. But what's the most important thing, Paul? Always be looking in the mirror. <laughs> Are you supposed to be doing anything while you're looking in the mirror? Oh, I'll always be performing. That's right. <laughs>